Hello, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amanda Webb, Research Specialist with the Desert LCC, and we are very pleased to have with us today Jeremy Weiss, Climate and Geospatial Extension Scientist at the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment. As part of Cooperative Extension at the University of Arizona, Jeremy is responsible for responding to emerging climate and geospatial information needs expressed by stakeholders. His activities also include developing and maintaining outreach efforts that help people put to use knowledge of weather and climate hazards in geospatial data. I want to let everyone know that we have linked to Drought View on our website at desertlcc.org. Thank you to everyone for joining us today, and thank you to Jeremy for sharing this tool with us. I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy now. Okay, well, thanks, Amanda, and thanks, of course, as well to the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative uh, for the opportunity to uh, participate this afternoon uh, in, in the webinar series. And, of course, good afternoon to all the attendees as well. Uh, brief introduction uh, of myself. Uh, for the past couple of years, I've been the climate and geospatial scientist with Cooperative Extension based here uh, on the UA campus in Tucson uh, within the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, but with responsibilities for working on topics statewide uh, as well as in the broader or across the broader Southwest. In addition to those two subject matter areas, I also have some background uh, in ecology and in environmental science more generally, and hopefully that's going to help me today in introducing you to or helping you to make even better use of Drought View. And I'm really just the messenger uh, today for a group of climate and remote sensing scientists uh, from not only within the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, but also the Department of Soil, Water, Environmental Science, and the School of Geography and Development. Uh, as well as technologists and developers from the uh, communications and cyber technologies group here uh, at the U of A uh, within the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, and as a group, we're working together on, on the continuing development of Drought View. And we've gotten data and support uh, from a variety of other entities, uh, both on campus and off, uh, as well. And that's something, of course, we'd like to keep going in the future. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is cover Drought View and some of its functionality, um, largely through looking at some, of, some examples of its recent use, such as determining rangeland conditions in southeastern Arizona during the monsoon. Uh, of course, that's our summer rainy season. Uh, and the timing of vegetation surveys in the low deserts of Arizona and California uh, for both native flora and invasive species. Uh, we'll also take a look at some of the uh, new capabilities of Drought View in reporting drought impacts and sharing map information. Uh, but first, uh, kind of a big picture context of what we'll be thinking about over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, if you work with data for environmental monitoring or, or modeling these days, uh, as I do, uh, you could probably understand why I relate to the gentleman in the lower left of this picture uh, in the sense of being overwhelmed at times, really, uh, from what is, I think safely to say, an enormous amount or a, a really big pile, if you will, of environmental data that currently is available and largely being compiled by scientists for other scientists, I think we can easily imagine how non-specialists could have challenges in working with the data, uh, let alone finding it and, and understanding it. But at the same time, uh, I think we can realize that we have a wealth of data, and if we are to appropriately analyze it and channel it and apply it, you know, we, can, we can inform agricultural and natural resource decisions, uh, as well as those in, in several other areas. So in other words, we simply want to take this 
massive, large amount of data and extract something meaningful from it. And this is where some of the utility of drought view is in providing visualization and facilitating evaluation of a large amount of remote sensing data that then can be interpreted by field experts to help with practical problems like local drought assessment. So let's go ahead and get more into uh, drought view at this point, and we'll just ask the question, what exactly is it? And we consider it to be a web-based decision support tool that combines satellite-derived measures of surface greenness with additional geospatial data. And with this description, you can easily see how you know, this is really the machinery part of Drought View. And the reason for putting this machinery together uh, is so that users can visualize and evaluate vegetation dynamics across space and over time, uh, often this is done in the context of drought, or at least that's what our experience has been to to date. Uh, but as we'll see, uh, people are using drought view for other applications as well. So in this description, I'm sure that you can tell uh, that the backbone of drought view really is remotely sensed data, uh, in particular satellite-derived measures of surface greenness. And uh, let's go ahead and dig into that a little bit, just so we're familiar, more familiar with those, that type of data. Uh, so here we've changed the drought view screenshot to one that is focused on southeastern Arizona. In the left map panel, uh, we're looking at a surface greenness base layer. Uh, in the right, the base layer is an aerial image. Uh, for reference, Tucson is located kind of in the left central parts of each of the map windows, uh, I-19 running south to the international border, and then of course you can, you can see I-10 kind of uh, rolling through the region. So to get a better handle on, on surface greenness data uh, over the next few slides, uh, let's, let's keep this question in mind and, and think about it a bit. How are satellite measures of surface greenness uh, again, those are on the left uh, map window uh, on this screenshot. How are they related to what we see in an aerial image, which is what we're looking at on the right? So the surface greenness data we are using for drought view come from the MODIS, or Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer Instrument, uh, which is aboard both the Terra and Aqua satellites. MODIS collects information about a number of atmospheric, land, and ocean phenomena through measurements over a pretty wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, there, of course, we have to recall long to short wavelengths of radiation, you know, ranging from you know, radio waves to microwaves, visible light, UV rays, uh, and, and so on. The coverage of the Terra and Aqua satellites allows for a complete electromagnetic view of the globe every one to two days, and the direction of their respective orbits is opposite. So one's going north to south, the other south to north, and this allows for measurements of the same area in both the morning and the afternoon. And that's going to help with minimizing optical effects like shadows in the landscape, uh, while also providing data on phenomena that change during the course of a day, uh, such as the buildup or dissipation of clouds. And in terms of surface greenness, the measure we just saw, and we'll see during the rest of this presentation, is the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, uh, which is a comparison between the amounts of the visible light and near-infrared parts of the electromagnetic spectrum reflected from Earth's surface. Uh, part of what makes this approach work uh, is that plants reflect electromagnetic radiation differently uh, relative to bare ground and to water. So a main thing to remember about 
remotely sensed measurements of surface greenness is that they are linked to several characteristics of vegetation, uh, such as growth at a location through time, or vegetation density and vegetation type uh, across space. So going back to the question that we posed a few moments ago um, and how our satellite measures of surface greenness related to what we might see in an aerial image, uh, in this image here, I'm sure you've been able to pick out that the higher NDVI values, which are depicted by darker green colors in the surface greenness picture, uh, those are relating to the sky islands in the southeast part of Arizona. So here, for example, in uh, north central Santa Cruz County, you can see the Santa Rita Mountains, uh, both in the aerial image and in the surface greenness image. Similarly to the southeast, you can pick out the Huachuca Mountains uh, in both of those images. Um, as you can see, broadly forested areas typically have higher NDVI values, or in this case, as it's displayed, darker green colors in the surface greenness image. Uh, whereas the intervening valleys between the sky islands, you know, the grasslands and the shrublands have relatively less uh, or, or have lower NDVI values, which are depicted by lighter shades of green. You might even pick out some of the badlands as they are along the Santa, San Pedro River Valley uh, in brown, um, as well as you can see just a hint of it here, the uh, Wilcox Playa out in Cochise County. Okay, so we have a, uh, hopefully, a, a good feel for what surface greenness data are uh, and, and how they're generated. Let's go ahead and move on now to uh, the recent use of drought view in supporting drought assessment and disaster assistance for southeastern Arizona cattle operations. Uh, we'll start with some quick background. Some of it's probably familiar, such as uh, the fact that monsoon storms from July through September uh, drive the growth of uh, a lot of annual and perennial vegetation, such as forbs, grasses, and shrubs, uh, while also providing stream flow and ponding that's, that's critical for livestock. And the summer rainy season is important in southeastern Arizona for additional reasons, uh, one being that the beef industry is a key part of the regional economic base. And you can see in this table that uh, it contributes several million dollars annually to the state's gross domestic product, uh, with Cochise County uh, taking a prominent role there. For rangelands in the southeastern corner of the state in Arizona, um, drought lowers vegetation productivity and subsequently can pressure cattle operations towards smaller herd sizes. That can lead to financial losses for ranchers. And this has been the case for southeastern Arizona for some time now, uh, as you're probably familiar, perhaps, uh, as drier than average conditions really have plagued the area for, for well over a decade, including the past few calendar years. Now, as the vast majority of grazing area in southeastern Arizona is on state and federal lands, ranchers often work with rangeland management personnel from agencies such as the Bureau of Land Management, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the Natural Resources Conservation Service to develop uh, appropriate plans for their, for their ranching operations. During the recent run of years with below average precipitation, uh, this collaboration between individual ranchers and, and agency land management uh, staff has, uh, this collaboration has taken on a new facet uh, of finding ways to mitigate drought-induced losses uh, that, of course, can severely harm or even eliminate a, a cattle operation. So one such solution is for ranchers to work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, Farm Service Agency through the Disaster Assistance Program to help mitigate livestock losses during drought events. But there's still uh, an obstacle with this solution. And determining drought-related losses 
you know, if, if you imagine, say, in the central part of the country, uh, in the Corn Belt, you know, determining drought-related losses is, is, is maybe, in those cases, a pretty straightforward process uh, when dealing with crops in that part of the nation, but it's m a much more challenging task when assessing forage across the, the large and pretty remote tracts of, of complex terrain that characterize not only the state, but also the, the region, the broader southwest. Ground-based measurements of precipitation and rangeland productivity collected by ranchers and agency personnel really are only going to provide snapshots of, of pretty local conditions. And thus, we're still left with the decision to, or, or, or the challenge really, to designate broader areas as being under drought. Um, again, since you know, we only have those, those local snapshots of, of local conditions. Uh, so how can we address this challenge? Well, to decide where grazing areas were or have been affected by drought over the past few years across southeastern Arizona, uh, rangeland management and uh, farm service agency personnel met with uh, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension staff to discuss a, a pretty good combination, a suite of relevant information sources. Uh, not only the local observations, as I, I was describing in the previous slide, uh, but also seasonal precipitation amounts, and of course, uh, given the topic of this webinar, surface greenness measures from remote sensing data. Uh, the participants at this meeting uh, were able to use DroughtView to corroborate their on-the-ground observations with the larger county-level patterns of areas where vegetation growth was high, uh, and where vegetation growth was low, and thus they were able to determine the extensiveness of recent drought conditions. Uh, they were also able to delineate the grazing areas where drought-induced losses occurred and where financial assistance, again, through the federal program, was justified. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the most recent of these meetings, uh, which actually took place earlier this month. Um, and, and again, it's, it's a re retrospective uh, analysis. And so we're, we're focusing on the year 2016, calendar year 2016. Um, you know, a couple precipitation and uh, surface greenness highlights. And for this, we'll, we'll focus on the monsoon time of the year. Uh, some of the highlights from 2016 were that across southeastern Arizona, <clears throat> uh, monsoon precipitation totals were above normal for much of the region. Um, at the start of the monsoon, uh, surface greenness uh, was a pretty good mix uh, of below, near, and above average uh, surface greenness. Uh, again, that's at the start. With that above average monsoon precipitation, uh, surface greenness values were mostly above average at the end of the monsoon, uh, at the end of September. So let's uh, take a little bit closer look uh, at this. Uh, during the monsoon, defined here as June through September, again, most of, of southeastern Arizona received above normal precipitation. That's indicated by the, the, the green areas. Uh, and our focus here really is across Greenlee, Graham, Cochise, and Santa Cruz counties. Uh, you know, those areas, the green areas received about 125% of normal precipitation uh, during that four-month June through September period. Uh, some areas received you know, upwards of 150, 175% uh, of normal seasonal precipitation. Those are the blue and darker blue areas. And some areas in the, in the four-county area also were close to normal, uh, those being colored white in this map. So this Again, largely mon above average monsoon precipitation last year made some noticeable improvements to drought conditions uh, over southeastern Arizona, uh, at least depicted by the U.S. Drought Monitor. Um, if you're not familiar with this, this national weekly map product, uh, it's really, you know, just in short, it's really focused on, on broad scale conditions. Um, so 
Uh, again, the, the above average monsoon precipitation made some noticeable improvements uh, shown through the drought monitor. Uh, at the beginning of, of uh, well, actually at the end of June, uh, much of the region was under moderate or severe drought, as indicated by the tan and orange colors, respectively. Uh, in this part of the state, by the end of September, uh, the vast majority of the area was um, downgraded in a positive way. Uh, maybe that's upgraded to uh, anomaly dr ab abnormally dry conditions, uh, again, by the end of the monsoon season. So we're going to go back to drought view, and uh, we're going to risk something here and actually go live to the browser window. And since uh, this is a webinar, uh, yeah, please feel free to follow along. Um, I'll go s relatively slowly through the different steps uh, as we take a look at, again, some of these conditions uh, in this recent drought meeting. Um, so the URL is uh, simply droughtview.arizona.edu. And your screen should uh, look like this here, there's a splash page. Uh, just go ahead at this point and click on Enter Drought View. Uh, we should see the uh, two map windows focused on the state of Arizona. And uh, so to get at uh, you know, this meeting example, let's go ahead and uh, work through a few steps. And then I'll uh, pose a question as far as asking you to um, determine where drought conditions may have existed last summer uh, and where some where might have the uh, federal agency land management staff uh, depicted or, or, or delineated drought conditions. So the first thing uh, to note or the first step is that we're going to switch uh, the, the right map window to the uh, aerial base layer. If you go down to the second tool uh, in the list of six, that's on the right side. Uh, go ahead and click on the, the second to the top. That's the base layers tool. We're going to switch the right base layer to the aerial map in this case. Go ahead and X out of that tool uh, dialog box or window. And either double click, uh, you can use the on the map on southeastern Arizona. You can also use the, the plus or zoom in button up here in the upper left of the map window to zoom in. Uh, scrolling the wheel on a mouse also works. And go ahead and, and zoom into uh, Cochise County uh, in southeastern Arizona. In the third tool to the top of the list uh, there on the right, the overlays tool, let's go ahead and click on roads. Uh, again, we'll need this for, for a little bit of spatial reference perhaps. And then we'll go back to the second tool to the top. And uh, we're going to change the what's called a biweekly composite period. Uh, if, you, if you look at the map now, you'll notice it's the, uh, the most recent data that we're able to uh, put into the system. Uh, it spans a 16-day time frame from April 23rd through May 8th. As I mentioned earlier, uh, MODIS data, you know, complete coverage of the globe every one to two days. The biweekly composite uh, procedure, if you will, uh, in short, is, is going to help us eliminate some of the contaminating effects uh, that you could imagine happening between a satellite orbiting the planet and the land surface. You know, clouds are an easy example to, that, that, that comes to mind there. So again, it's to kind of eliminate the, the contaminating effects of what's going on in the atmosphere and trying to get the best signal we can, if you will, of land surface conditions. So let's go ahead um, and select a different biweekly composite period. The first tool on the right at the top is, is a calendar-based tool. Uh, let's go ahead and switch that to uh, the end of September, early October last year, 2016. So, uh, if you can see where my cursor is, uh, right above the calendar, we're going to go ahead and just click on this uh, single uh, greater than less than sign, if you will, to the left of the month and the year, and move back monthly 
to uh, September 2016 there. Then in the calendar dates, we'll just select September 30th, and that's going to put us in the corresponding biweekly composite period, September 29th through October 14th. Okay, another step we'll take is to, uh, instead of looking at surface greenness, let's make it relative to uh, average surface greenness conditions for this time of year. So in the base layers uh, tool, second from the top, we're going to keep the greenness NDVI as the base layer on the left map window. Uh, but, as, but for the product, we'll switch to difference from average. And this is just an average calculated over the 2001 which is the start year of MODIS data through 2012. And we're currently working on updating that to, to a more current year. OK. So we got this set up uh, within the drought view window. Where would you designate drought conditions in Cochise County? Let me explain the color scheme here on, on the left real quick. Uh, difference from average. Basically, if you're seeing colors, uh, shades of orange, you are below average surface greenness uh, for that time, uh, that biweekly composite period uh, in, in the fall. If you're seeing blue or the shades of blue, you're above average surface greenness. Uh, white, you're pretty close to average surface greenness in this case. So in terms of designating drought conditions in Cochise County, uh, an initial thought uh, would be, well, anywhere there's below average surface greenness. And we can see that uh, occurring here in the east central part of the county, uh, as well as up here in the far extreme northeast corner uh, of the county. But before saying whether or not that's close to the right answer in this case, uh, we're going to go ahead and put on a different overlay. Again, the third to the top uh, tool there in the list on the right. And we're going to go ahead and select historical fires in the second column. That should bring up a, a bunch of polygons uh, brought in from the uh, GeoMac uh, organization, uh, which strong ties to the US Geological Survey. Um, each of the different colors of, of all those polygons is simply a reference to a different year. Uh, and I think they started about year 2000, if I'm not mistaken. If you go over to the left map window and click on the border of the pink polygon, um, you'll see that some of the details of that wildfire uh, pop up in a dialog box. Uh, that being, uh, in this case, the Horseshoe 2 fire uh, back in 2011 which uh, seems to burn quite a lot of the area of the Chiricahua Mountains. So if we think about surface greenness and, and why this area might be below average, uh, certainly converting a broadly forested area to one uh, of forest understory you know, as the vegetation comes back after a pretty, pretty um, substantial fire, uh, you know, from discussing surface greenness values earlier on, you could probably guess, well, below average, you know, those values might be because we're comparing, again, like a forest understory to, you know, what was pretty much average conditions back then anyways of being forest. So you may not actually think that this is uh, affected by drought during the uh, monsoon last year. However, these areas up in the extreme northeast corner of the state, uh, that is the San Simone Valley, I believe, uh, extending into southern Graham County. Those areas actually were corroborated with some of the uh, local based measurements uh, and you know, were candidates for being designated as drought. OK. That went safely. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, go back to the uh, presentation slides and uh, you know, wrap up this example use of drought view with a few concluding thoughts. Uh, one is that by bringing together a variety of information related to both precipitation totals and range land conditions, uh, again, both ground-based and remotely sensed, uh, this combination proved useful for determining drought impacts to cattle operations over the past few years, 
in southeastern Arizona. Even with uh, the ability to determine grazing conditions in remote areas where on-the-ground observations are lacking, ranchers and agency personnel in this part of the state still need to contend with the possibility, of course, that periods of below average precipitation occur over a season or several years. Uh, new actions and solutions uh, thus may be needed in order to better cope with some of these challenging conditions uh, you know, that are pretty much par for the course in the region, really. Nonetheless, uh, real-time monitoring and retrospective efforts like the one I just described uh, in conjunction with disaster assistance can improve the odds of cattle operations surviving droughts in this arid and semi-arid region. Let's switch to uh, another example of recent drought to use, uh, and this is in its support of timing vegetation surveys in the low deserts of Arizona and California. Uh, and for this, I'll let Jim Malusa, who's a plant geographer here in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, uh, provide us with some quick background. Uh, imagine you can pick any place in the continental U.S. and find out if the plants are lying low, stricken by drought, or greening up with a shot of moisture and warmth. And this is what really interests Jim and his work, uh, and he works a fair bit on pretty vast military ranges. He's chasing after invasive plants in Arizona, uh, as well as making a flora in California. Uh, Jim says he's long known that sensors on satellites can detect actively growing plants, but uh, he claims anyway he's lacked the brains and money to utilize the data. So one of his projects had him working in the Chocolate Mountain Aerial Gunnery Range in southeastern California. And here Jim was tasked with making a flora of mostly a mostly undocumented, uh, you know, 200,000 hectares worth of, of bomb craters and deserts. Uh, prior to using drought view, he'd spend days searching for places where, you know, he'd be able to find the flowers and the fruits that make a, as he put it, a, a specimen worthy of an, of an herbarium sheet. Uh, but with drought view, um, he's been able to take a different approach. And uh, let's go ahead and, and go back to our web browser window. And again, please uh, follow along. Uh, hopefully, I'll go at a pace uh, and, and you know, probably provide enough description for you to easily tag along on this example um, as far as how Jim has been able to utilize Drought View in his work. Um, so we're back to where we just were uh, in southeastern Arizona. Let's go ahead and turn off the wildfire uh, boundary uh, overlay layer. And again, third tool from the top. Uh, just go ahead and click on historical fires, and that should take it off of the map, uh, both map windows. Next step is to go to the base layers tool. Let's go ahead and change the uh, right map window to a topo map. That'll help us a little better, I think, with, with uh, getting us in the right place and uh, giving us some good spatial reference. Okay, we'll close out of that window. Uh, next, we're going to fly over to the Chocolate Mountains, which are in southeastern California. Uh, feel free to zoom out a couple levels, uh, just to make panning a little more efficient. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're going in right to the east of the Salton Sea. Um, we get pretty close, I think. Something, uh, let's go with something like that. Next step is to change the biweekly composite period. Um, in this case, we're going to go to the very end of 2016. So again, in that top tool, um, the Select Dates tool panel, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, you can see here just to the right of the month and the year designation uh, above the calendar dates, uh, there's a single greater than less than symbol. Let's go ahead and Click on that a few times, get to December 2016, as it says in gray right here, and uh, yeah, just go ahead and click on 
December 31st. And we should then automatically go to the corresponding biweekly composite period, that being December 18th through January 2nd. Whoa. Actually, my mistake. We're uh, now in 2017, so we actually need to go back a year. And there's a way to do that. It's the double, greater than, or less than symbols. Uh, let's see here. There we are. So we're going to be in December 2015 and, and January 2016, uh, hence my confusion. And so, again, just click on the 31st of December and our corresponding biweekly composite date, or, or period rather, and this is consistent with my notes, uh, December 19th through January 23rd, spanning 2015 and into 2016. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, this is the map that Jim made in Drought View. He zoomed into this area. He was looking at the difference from average uh, NDVI product on the left. Um, and so we'll switch back at this point to the slideshow. Um, how did Jim, you know, after making this map in Drought View, printing it out, took it with him in the field? Uh, how is he helping? How is this map helping him uh, make a flora in this? As you saw in the pictures, pretty pretty arid region. Well, here's how Jim's using it, and you may have very well guessed this uh, just a second ago. Um, he took this out. <laughs> And, you know, for a pretty broad area, 300 square miles, uh, along with a colleague of his from UC Riverside, he headed straight for the blue, uh, which, of course, that means greener than average, uh, surface greenness values above average. He headed straight for the blue areas. And so, as this picture kind of hints at, uh, he wasn't only able to find some of the... Uh, say, more common lower desert species in bloom, but he was also, or they also were able to find a, a never before documented species of pea flowering uh, in January, which uh, apparently was surprising to Jim, uh, without drought view helping him to find the areas where, again, rain had fallen and the vegetation was, was greening up, uh, essentially. So now let's take a quick look at Jim's chasing of invasive plants that turn desert landscapes like this into ones like that, uh, which of course, as you probably very well know, is a, is a turn for the worse for a number of region, reasons, uh, greater fire risk being one of them. So Jim is using drought view to coordinate surveys for an invasive annual, Sahara mustard, uh, on the Barium Goldwater Range in southwest Arizona. And if you're familiar with that range, uh, it, it covers a pretty broad area of the southwest part of the state. It is enormous, uh, as he calls it. And uh, you, you could probably easily imagine how previous efforts to uh, control the mustard populations across that vast area, they were in vain, as he describes. Um, you know, there could always be a place uh, where precipitation had fallen and the Sahara mustard had been able to germinate and, and grow. And of course, nobody would be able to find that because these areas you know, could be very, very remote. So using drought view and kind of the same approach he used really for, for making the flora in southeastern California. Um, he's been directing the range wardens uh, of the rain, uh, of that area, uh, to the areas where, again, he's seeing blue on, on the difference uh, from average maps, you know, above average surface greenness uh, condition. Uh, he's also, as part of this project, developed a smartphone app to simply, you know, record GPS coordinates, uh, you know, when they do have positive local confirmation of these plant populations. That data then is stored locally in the phone, as he described there. Uh, within the app, and uh, you know, once the range wardens get back to civilization, 
within a cell tower range. Uh, that data is uploaded to a central site. At that point, the exotic plant management team of the National Park Service takes that information, uh, helps it, uh, or uses it to help with their planning of uh, control and eradication efforts across, again, this really remote, uh, large area. So Jalfi is helping them pinpoint those, those types of locations. Let's go ahead and wrap up uh, our looking at some examples of recent drought view use with a few related uh, big picture thoughts on the availability of a huge amount of environmental data and the ability to visualize it and evaluate it. From a pretty interesting post online, I think, uh, about the trials and tribulations of working with, with all these data, uh, I think it's fair to say that the point of tools like DroughtView uh, isn't necessarily to show people more data, but to enable people to learn from these data. And part of it, such efforts, uh, those of us working on DroughtView, for example, uh, is the behind-the-scenes removal of, um, I think I skipped ahead a step. There we go behind the scenes removal of some of the mess and complexity uh, that's of course going to be a part of working with large amounts of environmental data. Um, that's pretty important um, because you know with that hurt a lot of the way, stakeholders then are going to have a more streamlined experience. Uh, that's going to allow them to be able to ask some new questions, maybe think through some new problems that they may not have been able to do before uh, due to either time constraints or limited resources. But I think, and we've got a couple good examples uh, that we've gone over here, uh, you know, just having the tool, of course, isn't going to be the whole story. Uh, you still really need that local context. Um, and, and that's where, you know, putting those two things together, that's the magic combination, if you will, uh, as far as acting with data um, and, and being able, again, to extract something meaningful from, from these large environmental data sets. It's, it's equal parts technical analysis and local context. Okay, so in the uh, remaining time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the web browser and uh, just go over a couple features uh, that we may not have looked at so far uh, with, with Drought View. Um, we'll just start at the top of the, uh, the, the tool list there on the right side. Um, another feature to point out with the, you know, selecting the, the biweekly composite period uh, with, with the uh, chronological data, the surface greenness data in this case, uh, we do have an option here to desynchronize time. Uh, before I click on that, if you notice, by default, both of the map windows, the left and right map windows, are going to show the time-dependent data for the same biweekly composite period. Uh, you know, if you're, you're still on the Melusa example here in the Chocolate Mountains, that's December 19th through January 3rd, uh, 2016 in this case. By clicking on desynchronize time, you can set different biweekly composite periods for each or, or for the left and right map windows. So for example, here, if we wanted to move a month backward uh, with the left map window, uh, we could do that and then compare it you know, visually to another biweekly composite period, another time period. So for example, on the left, we now have November 17th through December 2nd, 2015, whereas on the right, and let's assume, well, let's not just assume, let's go ahead and do that. Um, go to the base layers tool, uh, second down from the top, and we'll go ahead and uh, bring back that difference from average uh, NDVI product, uh, difference from average surface greenness. So we can compare two different time periods. Uh, in, in, with this feature, uh, new feature of Drought View. Going back to the base layers tool, um, you'll notice in these base layer drop-down menus for both the left and right 
map windows. Uh, we have, of course, the, the NDVI surface greenness product that we've been using and, and talking about during this presentation. Uh, there's another vegetation index, uh, the Enhanced Vegetation Index, EVI. That is a, a slightly different calculation of surface greenness values, um, and it's uh, one of the reasons for its being is that it's uh, a little bit, uh, shows a little more of the nuance, if you will, uh, of areas that are highly or densely vegetated. Um, we also have a data quality uh, base layer, and if we click on that, and uh, in this window here on the left, you can see uh, basic, that's going to show us where some trouble spots might be in terms of data quality. The, the blue areas on the left in this example uh, are showing where the data are considered good. Uh, the red areas, uh, those are being uh, marginal. White areas, if we have them here, and maybe we can see some if we were to zoom out um, and uh, pan to the north, those are going to be areas say northern Arizona, those are areas of snow and ice, and you can see that some of the marginal areas are around um, snow and ice areas. Gray would be clouds and black would be no data, say, to, to an instrument error. Um, that way you can get an idea when you are looking at uh, surface greenness values, get an idea of the data quality uh, of those data that, that, that you're examining. We've also added uh, precipitation. And this uh, is the precipitation totals during that biweekly composite period that's denoted at the lower part of the map window uh, based on daily precipit gridded uh, precipitation data. So if you were considering drought conditions um, in an area, uh, you know, you can look at, you know, some of the recent precipitation that may have fallen and that could help you get a better handle on whether or not, you know, say if you have drought conditions, might they improve a bit uh, in, the coming, in the coming weeks. Uh, back to the base layers panel. Um, we looked at aerial maps uh, already as well as the topo maps. Um, and of course we just have none, uh, which gives us you a dark gray base map, just for simple spatial reference. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out here is the uh, disjoint extents, or you, know, you can kind of unlock the spatial areas uh, of, of the two maps, if you will, where, you know, as you notice, zooming into one area on a map was reproduced in the other map window. Uh, when you disjoin the spatial extents, um, you're able to zoom into an area uh, in one map and in the other map leave uh, you know, a different spatial domain or, or area at, you know, at which you're looking. So that might be good, for example, if looking at a regional view as well as a, a more local view um, within the two map windows. Quickly, uh, you know, we have a lot of other overlays, uh, largely for spatial reference, um, available here now uh, with drought view, including grazing allotments for the state of Arizona, uh, federal and tribal lands, um, management agencies. Uh, we also have the current U.S. drought monitor. We took a look at some of that data earlier on in the presentation. Uh, we also looked at historical fires. Current year fires uh, also are an overlay that you can add to the map. Um, as well as watersheds, and that's going to be the different uh, hydrologic unit code, uh, I believe there are six, uh, or, or HUCs as they're also called, um, that you, you know, those are data also available to add to drought view. So the add point to map tool, uh, the fourth one down uh, in, in the list on the right, is really the starting point to uh, get at using uh, one of the new features of Drought View that I mentioned uh, in, the, in the intro, and that is the uh, Drought Impacts Reporting. Uh, in this case, what we'll do is uh, you can enter a latitude, longitude combination, or an address, as well as um, just manually placing a point, and we'll go ahead and do that 
for an example, here on the left, uh, once that point has been placed in the map, uh, click on it and you should get a small dialog box. It'll report the latitude and longitude, uh, as well as provide a link to, uh, again, starting to report a drought impact. Clicking on that link should bring up a, a, a dialog box uh, where you can start to enter related information. Uh, the first line is related to the category uh, of drought impacts. And here we have uh, a handful of different ones, including tourism and recreation, agriculture, plants and wildlife, water, health, uh, wildfire, and of course other for when those previous categories don't quite suffice. Uh, we also have email. You can enter an email for contacting, a, brief, uh, a spot for a brief description, um, what the what you'd like to report, as well as the uh, the ability to mark your observation data of the particular drought impact. Uh, attachments here, uh, you could upload a photo from the field, for example, or a corresponding report, uh, a PDF file, for example. Um, the, the idea behind the drought impact survey is, uh, or at least one of the ideas, is to help some of the agency staff who nonetheless are filling out this kind of information uh, to help them facilitate uh, the reporting of drought impacts. Um, it may help them in that process, but also um, you know, if you were to fill this out and click Save, which I'm not going to do here in this case, but when you save a drought impacts report, it goes into a general drought view um, impacts database, and that gets us to our second to last tool there in the list. Um, you can go ahead and click or highlight all of the uh, categories. And depending on the population of the drought impacts database, uh, you may need to zoom out from a, a local map view uh, to be able to see what else in the region has been reported. So for example, you know, as we're just getting started with this feature, uh, there are a handful of drought impacts reports across Arizona. Uh, this one down here by Tucson, if you click on that icon, um, it relates, you know, discusses some of the stream flow issues um, related to an area east of uh, the Tucson metro area. Uh, and you can also see here uh, a report related to that particular issue. Um, so again, you know, seeing the collective of drought impacts then can, can give a user a better feel for uh, you know, how extent, the extent of impacts, you know, what they might be uh, in the region at a, at a given time. So getting to the last tool in, in the tool, line up there on the right. Um, you know, we'll start here. The more at the bottom, you know, more about drought view, that gets you back to that splash page that shows up when you initially start the website or, or land at the website. Um, you know, some of the information there uh, is going to show, uh, discuss more about the data sources and, and you know, how are they created uh, that, that we're able to, you know, the data that we're displaying here, both the surface base layers, the surface greenness data, the precipitation data, as well as the overlays, uh, you know, like the U.S. drought monitor layer or the, the watershed layer, for example. So you'll be able to learn more about the data there. Uh, there's also a basic uh, how-to web page, so it goes through some of the, some of the stuff we're working through now, uh, the different features, how to use them. Uh, the middle option here is to print the map. Um, you know, that's going to, as it says, you know, allow you to have the paper copy like, like Jim did and using that out in the field uh, or you know, turning it into a PDF, of course. And then uh, the create share link. And that's a new feature that I, that I also mentioned. Um, so say you went through the Drought View website, you made, you know, say a customized map like, like I have here on the screen or what you might have on your computer right now. If you'd like to share that with colleagues and um, you don't go the print map route, uh, this, this might be the way to go. And, you know, you click on the create share link button, uh, 
specific URL, a unique URL shows up. Uh, just simply copy that and put it into a, a web browser. And instead of starting at you know the regional area that uh, Job View by default initially starts at, you can see here that it goes right to the customized window that we generated um, during the webinar. So that's, a, that's a, I think, a very nice feature uh, for helping, again, to share the information uh, and, and, and how you're working through the data and some of the, uh, say, knowledge or information that you're extracting from the data sets that we have here. Okay, so that's kind of a quick tour of Drought View uh, and, and some of the features that uh, you might use. Uh, hopefully, there's some helpful ones in there for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just put up a final slide that shows some related resources, um, a recent cooperative extension bulletin, again, on, on how to use Drought View is the first link, uh, a YouTube video uh, discussing Drought View in, in a similar fashion, and some of its example, other example uses uh, is available on YouTube as well as some general drought uh, information sources on the web, um, both at a national level, such as with the U.S. Drought Monitor and Drought Portal, uh, U.S. Climate Prediction Center as well. Uh, there's also a, a continental drought monitor product, the North American Drought Monitor. That's that last link uh, there in the lineup. With that, um, Amanda and Ashwin, let's go ahead and um, open it up to questions. Thanks everyone for, for joining the webinar today. Great, thank you Jeremy. It looks like there's really a lot of potential uses for Drought View. So we have some time for questions now. If you have a question, you can use the chat box to ask any questions that you may have. Alternatively, you can raise your hand on your computer by clicking the Participants tab and hitting the Raise Hand button at the bottom of the Participants list and we will call your name and ask you to unmute your phone. Looks like we have a couple people typing some questions here. Give them just a second. Uh, okay, question from Eve. Has this application been used for fire management? That is something that uh, I think there's some potential for. Uh, one of my colleagues on the DrawView project um, well, several of them work with remote sensing data and, and have looked at some of the wildfire uh, uh, issue, uh, generally speaking. Uh, there is some potential that, that they think is there for drought view for helping to track uh, some of the wildfire, um, say, danger conditions, uh, looking at, again, some of these difference from average uh, type products. Uh, you know, showing where landscape has dried out, maybe more prone or susceptible to fire ignition and, and fire spread and things like that. Uh, so I think there's there's some room for, again, potential room for uh, some some utilization of drought view and, and the data that we have within it uh, that can be applicable to um, the the fire management topic. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I have a question. So what, sure. is the what is the smallest scale at which these data are meaningful? Yes, that's a, a good question whenever it comes to, uh, to geospatial data. Uh, the MODIS data, an individual pixel, is 250 meters by 250 meters, approximately. Uh, you know, it's a little over 800 feet uh, on a side. And Pixels are just those individual grid boxes or squares you know, that you know, these gridded data sets you know, use as kind of like a spatial unit, if you will. Um, so within those pixels, the you know if you're looking at local conditions within you know at a finer scale than than what those pixels are, are able to show you. Um, then the remote sensing information 
you know, it, it's, it's not going to provide you information on that really fine scale. You know, the, the finest scale, again, is kind of on that 250 by 250 meter level. Um, so I think you know, that's a, as close a look as you can get at the land surface uh, with this particular MODIS product. Um, of course, there are other remote sensing data out there. Some are coarser and some are even finer than this. Uh, but in terms of finding one that, um, you know, with a long enough data record and, and, and you know, continual production, um, you know, this is what uh, you know, came to be the best product for the, for the Drought View um, website. Okay, thanks. So we have another question here. Uh, is it possible for the satellite to filter specific vegetation or uh, predominant vegetation type? Yes. Um, some of the remote sensing, uh, say science, if you will, um, does look at what they call spectral signatures of different vegetation types. And, um, you, know, you know, in a way, it's, it's getting at, you know, why are some areas, you know, going back to our, when we first started looking at drought view and, and the surface greenness values, some areas were darker green and some areas were lighter green. Um, you know, that spectral signature you know, kind of you know, works with, with that kind of, you know, uh, comparison between areas. Um, you know, there's information there with what the satellite's collecting to potentially differentiate between vegetation types. That's not available yet um, on the Drought View website. Uh, it, it can be done, though. Um, I'm trying to think. The Yeah, and again, it's, you know, that's also an issue that, um, or question that also relates to the previous question on, on spatial resolution. Um, you know, we're really not able to, to, to pick up information um, at a finer scale than that 250 by 250 meter grid box. Uh, so, you know, changes within, vege within that area of vegetation aren't going to be shown. So you kind of have to balance um, that um, aspect of the data as well when thinking about um, separating out different types of vegetation from, you know, using remote sensing data. Okay, great. And I just have one more question here. I noticed that there are grazing leases available for Arizona, but not other states. Is there a process for expanding on these overlays? That's something, uh, yes, we've, we've, um, had requested before to get those grazing allotments uh, for, for other states in the region as well. Um, that's, uh, you know, again, we're, we're continuing development of the website, and I think that's something that is on the list of considerations uh, as far as, you know, trying to find, you know, the data uh, and, and incorporate it into the, um, the web map application. Uh, the grazing allotments for the state of Arizona right now um, come through as a web service, meaning that it's the data set's parked on a state agency computer somewhere, and we're simply you know, pulling that in on the fly uh, uh, to to display on the screen. Um, you know, are other states? You know, do other states have that um, service? Uh, Possibly. Uh, it's, again, it's something we'll look into. Um, and, um, yeah, you're not alone in asking that question. So uh, we'll see how, how the uh, you know, future development of the website goes and, and how we're best able to, to address that need. Great. Well, it looks like it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating today. I want to thank Jeremy again for taking the time to be with us today. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel and our, on our website at desertlcc.org slash resources. Once again, thanks to everyone and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.